I'd like to introduce for Alan Kravitz, who is the chair of the planning committee of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Co-chair. Co-chair. With, with, with Christine Kavir. I thank you all for coming. Uh, this thing grew out of, I guess I started to talk to Jane uh, about a year and a half ago about 350. And what about the next? What comes after 350? And that we should start thinking about shaping the future. And you know, and it also came out of the discussions we've had at planning, not only about looking into the into the long range and looking at regulations, but it became obvious that we had to do some sort of here and now things. This is the here and now part. So uh, I'm not going to speak for a long time. I'm going to introduce Lynn Pinder. Uh, for select one, for, sorry, sorry about that, from the Board of Selectmen, uh, who's going to introduce our guest. Thanks a lot for coming. Wow, we got a lot of people here. Um, so, if anyone doesn't know me, I'm Lynn Pinder, I'm on your Board of Selectmen. Um, I just want to thank Alan tonight for putting this together, and I'm sure Christine has something to do with it as well. And really, to all of you for coming out, I see a lot of you who are on volunteer boards and commissions who already give a lot of time in town and, um, to come to these types of things. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to introduce um, Kip. Oh, I haven't met yet. Bergs <laughs> 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 Drum. Um, he's the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Economic and Community Development. And um, when I read your bio, um, and I started talking to Alan about what placemaking was, um, and you look at what your title is, um, I think of two things. There's the economic development, and then there's community. And I know a lot of you are working on economic development in terms of bringing in new business, growing the tax base. These are types of things we've all been talking about. Um, how do we market Unilever property to get a developer in that, that makes sense? How do we get um, something happened at the old Morgan site. But as Alan just said, and what Jane said to me as I walked in, is what can we do now? And this placemaking, what a great, what a great concept um, to get all of you together as a community and think about what we can do now. How can we market this town now? How can we brand this town now? And I think, um, Kip, you know, just from what I've read um, about you, what progress and success in the city of Stanford and in the island and you know with culture and tourism and just really helping uh, communities to, to brand themselves and, and you know, bring folks in to see what's great. And I guarantee we've got better folks in Clinton than they had in Stanford. So um, what, you, what you learned today, hopefully. Um, the future governor may be sitting here. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I wish I could stay tonight, um, but I see so many uh, people that I, I know are so involved in this community, and I know you're going to learn so much tonight, and I have a feeling I'm going to be hearing a lot of good stuff out there and, uh, you know, hear, hear what happened tonight. So have a great night, and it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. So, uh, I have a little experience in Clinton because, um, Way back when, Clinton was part of the same Senate district as East Hampton. And uh, my wife ran for Senate in 1988, um, and she won Clinton. Uh, her name was Marilyn Purick. You may remember that name. Uh, it was a 10-town district. She won nine out of the 10 towns and then um, lost by a greater margin in Madison than she won by the other nine towns. And I think she got 49.5% of the vote. So. But we, we spent, um, as you do when you're campaigning, we, we, spent, we went to every parade, um, <laughs> every event, every festival. And uh, I was saying to Marilyn earlier today that of all the communities that we discovered during that campaign, I liked Clinton the best. I just like the people of Clinton the best. So, uh, your newly appointed first select person <laughs> is right, the, the people here are better. Um, and I just want to introduce Rod France, who uh, I was, uh, I met in, well, I'm not sure where I met, but we did some serious damage together in Stanford uh, before we started working together at the state. Rod runs uh, our Create Here Now project which is um, bringing life to empty storefronts in towns and cities around, around the state by repurposing those storefronts with artists or artist uh, 
or makers, uh, craftsmen of various kinds, uh, and helping those entrepreneurs to become successful enough that they can start paying some rent and then pay market rate and stay where they are. And in the course of doing that, really has developed a network of artists around the state. And one of the things we found is that artists um, are used to thinking of life as a gig. You know, you, you, you're, they're sort of nomadic. And you, you can pick up stakes and pop down someplace else. And so as they start to think of themselves as a network, they're actually willing to come to each other's events and uh, give a place the sense of what it would be like if it was a fully engaged creative place. It's sort of artificially by having a whole bunch of artists show up from different places in one place. And what we find is that it gives the people in that place a sense of what the future might be and, and they then redouble their efforts to create that future. And uh, I would say, um, one of the key ideas is that places are not so much the stage as the play. It's not so much the buildings as the people. Um, I really believe that. It's very important, all the physical stuff, but it, it really is just the, the stage set for the play that we act upon it. And it's not just the plays today, but it's also the plays that have taken place over time that we remember and inspire us, and the place that will come after us that will be inspired by what we do today. So uh, the way I think about it is that placemaking is a conversation that play takes place in space and time with both our predecessors and our descendants. And we asked ourselves, what will this place look like based on what we leave behind. So we are making a place that in turn makes us in the making of it. So it's a two directional exercise and we are by what we do inspiring future generations just as past generations have inspired us. It's a, it's a very deep thing. Um, that great American uh, philosopher, Linda Ronstadt, uh, put it this way, she said, a place is where your soul inhabits the soil. And she said that, at least I heard it quoted in an article in the travel section of the New York Times a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. A guy was going around with her in the borderlands between uh, southern Arizona and northern, northern Mexico where she grew up, and she had relatives on both sides of the border. And wherever she went with this reporter, there was song and music. And you, you could tell that she and her family were making those places, but that place was definitely making her, making them, making the next generation of her family into singers. Um, so just, just think in your own head right now what place or places made you. Just think about that. And what was it about that place that en enabled it to kind of get under your skin and, and form you in a way? You know, it might have been a park. It might have been a certain house. It might have been a family trip to Mesa Verde. That was one of the places that made me. I was so enchanted by it. I was just totally consumed by Indians at the time. I was, I think, six, <laughs> maybe eight, I forget, six, I think. And I decided that it was never going to get better than that. That was, that was the best place I was ever going to be. So I said to my family, they could go on, but I was going to stay. <laughs> and, uh, my father actually had to drag me kicking and screaming into the car, and I wouldn't speak for him for, I think, two weeks. Um, so, I mean, places really get to you. And are you lucky enough to live in a place like that now or work in a place like that now? Um, next time you're with a group of folks and you can uh, steer the conversation, ask that question of 
your <coughs> table mates what place made you, you will get literally a sense of where they're coming from. And you'll get a deeper window into their soul than you could by asking any other question. I've done it now over the last two or three months. Oh, a half dozen times, including with a group of 100 people, where they asked each other that question at tables of eight. And the notes that were taken from those conversations were incredible. Um, so try it sometime. <clears throat> so there's a huge amount to placemaking. And um, I wrote a paper about it that some of you may have read. It's called um, The Power of Place in Connecticut. And it's um, available on our website. You, Alan's got it, and, and you've sent it out. So you probably have, have some of you read that. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to go through that whole 40-page document. Trust me on that. <laughs> but uh, there are some ideas there. What I was trying to do in that document, and it's just a piece of placemaking. But by kind of talking about that piece, you'll get a sense of what the fabric is that we're trying to weave uh, as we make places. And first of all, you know, all placemaking is local. So the state doesn't make places. Only people in local places make places. And we're simply a funder, a convener, a cheerleader, an enabler of your efforts. But all placemaking is local. Um, and what we're trying to do is say, how do we take these five threads, if you will, that I, I have, I think that's me, I'll uh, turn this off so that we uh, don't have to cure the lean urbanist <laughs> listserv pinging me <laughs> every two minutes with some email. I, I got on this email list of these folks that are trying to do the next thing being <coughs> new urbanism. I thought it was an interesting exercise. I turned my head for what seemed like a couple of days in normal people's time, and there were all of a sudden 900 unread <laughs> emails on my um, And some of it's actually really interesting, but um, at one point I sent, I, I sent them an email that said, it was just titled, Zero Unread Emails. And I said, thank you for this new sphere of accomplishment that I didn't, didn't know I needed. Um, anyway. Um, Five threads that that I have my hands on: branding, innovation, historic preservation, art, and tourism. So those are the functions that I manage at the state level. And they 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 started out as separate entities. You know, two or three of them were combined, and only just in the last couple of years they were all put uh, together. But they've never been integrated. They've been co-located, but they've never ever been integrated. Now we're asking the question, well, what if we did integrate them? What if we did history and art at the same time in the same place? What if we used tourism to actually market the art and history of our great places, uh, to tell the stories of our great places? What if we blended this uh, kind of entrepreneurial startup, young entrepreneur sort of thing with the rest of placemaking, what would that look like? And how could we use the state's branding to reinforce placemaking? So th those are the questions that I tried to pose and, and think about, not necessarily completely answer, but put some thoughts out there to provoke a conversation that we're now in the midst of having. Uh, this is one of the... Uh, I guess interesting challenges of my job would be a good way to put it. I have nine boards for those five functions. I have a board for art. I have a board for history. I have a board for tourism. And if that's not enough, I have a board for art, history, and tourism combined. <laughs> then I have a strategic partner in the Connecticut Trust, which funded your um, Vital Communities Initiative with our money. We essentially outsource things to them to get things done. And Connecticut Humanities is another statutory partner. Then we have community advocacy groups, and one for art, one for history, one for tourism. 200 discrete board members in the nine boards. 
And one could say, you know, oh my God. Or you could say, what if those 200 folks aligned around a common vision, what, what could that do? What, what could 200 engaged volunteers, pretty, you know, all of us are powerful people if we want to be. They are. And, you know, we can make something happen. We can create a place-making movement, um, especially if we link our state, uh, statewide efforts to conversations like this one that want to happen at the local level. And I've actually thought of enlisting um, the libraries as the vehicle by which to take this conversation to the local level and actually had a conversation with Ken Wiggins who runs the State Library about that topic. So it's kind of fitting that we're having one of these first placemaking conversations in a library. And I'm so encouraged that Clinton seems to have caught, and seems to have caught the placemaking bug. We're hopeful that um, many communities will. And the, so we're having this conversation with our boards. We're inviting other folks to be part of it. We've had two convenings. First one at the old state house that was just really asking that question, what place made you? What was it about that time that made that possible? And thinking about that, what are the kind of challenges and opportunities for making places in Connecticut? That was the first conversation. Then we had one in New London that was the stories of our places. We had everybody come prepared to tell a story about a favorite place in Connecticut. Could be where they live, where they worked, or just a favorite place. And we prepped it with some readings and a panel that talked about the <coughs> incredible origin story of Connecticut and John Whitford Jr. and um, David Leff's uh, book, Hidden in Plain Sight. David was there, Walter Woodward, who wrote the book on Winthrop, was there. And my friend uh, Robert Lever, who's really the living expert on James Hillman, the Jungian psychologist who really thought deeply about cities and soul. He was interviewing them, channeling Hillman, getting at these, uh, very, you know, it's sort of deep. Uh, <laughs> and, but you know, some folks said, are, are you kind of going too far with this? Um, but actually, no, because I, you know, I think people will go as deep into the stuff as you let them. And, there's almost no plumbing the depth of our places. That's what David Leff uh, exposed. I, I got from him this idea that Connecticut at its heart is this um, marriage of nature and culture. And Clinton is a marriage of nature and culture. Now, neither Connecticut nor Clinton have always honored that marriage. I mean, there's some stuff that's a little off track. But what... Um, what I found that's really interesting is people who want to make an impact on a place, who want to be part of placemaking, who want to leave their mark, adding to the marks of those who have come before us, that group, particularly younger people choosing a place where they're going to settle. They've gone through the first job, they've gone through the first several relationships, they maybe have a life partner of some kind or decide they're not going to go that route. And they're looking for a place where they're going to spend most of the rest of their life. And some of those downshift from big cities to smaller places, like our small cities and our, our towns like Clinton. And they, they downshift because they think in a smaller place they can have greater impact. So that's our market. Folks looking to have impact. That's why I came to Connecticut, came to Hartford when I was whatever it was, 24, 25. I wanted to have impact, and I thought I could. I thought Hartford was big enough to have all the problems, but small enough to solve them. Slightly delusional in that, but it's kept me going all this year, all these years, and I've moved around since then. But I wanted to have impact. Now, here's the thing: when you want to have impact, you actually don't want a perfect place. So, because you want to fix it. You want to make it better. So, it's not a problem that Clinton's not perfect. It's actually an advantage that it's not perfect. I mean, you've got to have some good bones, which you do. You know, this 
what I would call this marriage of nature, or what David Leff would call this marriage of nature and culture, that's, I think, sort of the basis of our value proposition as a state, both for residents and for tourists. You've got that. It's not perfect, but you can fix the past mistakes and you can do infill of the kind you're planning to do with the Cheeseboro Pond site and make it look like it was all planned that way in the first place. Once it's done, it's going to be incredible. I mean, you're going to add stuff to what you have that's going to create a hole that made us, you know, that, wow, that's what we were doing. Um, so that's, that's not a problem. That's actually an advantage. You, you, you have to own up to both what you have and what you've done wrong, and you have to kind of invite yourselves and invite newcomers to help you add in the stuff that needs to be added in and take out some stuff that maybe was a mistake. Um, that's a very attractive message in, in terms of a brand. That's the brand that you want to communicate. And if you want an example of, of a place that's done it extraordinarily well, there's a link in that document that was sent out to a video that was done by the city of Buffalo. And I, I found out since I wrote the paper that they actually did the video to recruit the Congress of New Urbanism convening that's going to take place in the beginning of June. They were bidding, I guess, against other places and they had this video done, uh, Buffalo, America's Best Designed City. And it's phenomenal. They talk about how uh, this brother of L'Enfant laid out the city and these wonderful radials, uh, you know, where there are these parkways where, you know, just walking the dog is a spiritual experience. Um, and it attracted Olmsted to lay out their park system because he thought they already had the best plan in America to build upon. With Olmsted having done that, they then attracted Richardson, Sullivan, and Wright, the three greats of American architecture, to build some of their best buildings there. So they say, you know, we're the best design city in America. Now, we admit we made some mistakes. We, we, we put this highway between the city and the waterfront. We put some freeways right on those parkways, slicing through, right through some of Olmsted's parks. But you know what? We're going to take down that highway. We're going to rip up that freeway. We're going to put the park back. And we want you all to come and help us do it. That is pitch perfect. That is exactly the message that will attract not just, not just young talent. Uh, my wife is part of the Buffalo diaspora. And they communicate <laughs> with each other. And when somebody came across this video, they sent it to us. And we watched it. And we were... We were almost ready to pack our beds and move the Buffalo. That was just so powerful. So, you know, it, it's a story. It's a, the, all brands that are any good are a story. It's not a slogan. It's not a tagline. It is. I mean, there is a tagline. We have, we have you could call it a tagline, still revolutionary, but still revolutionary is a story. It's about the fact that for 350 odd years, we've had a steady habit of revolutionary thought and action. And we still are doing it. We've been at the front of every cultural, political, economic, social revolution in the history of the country. And we're still doing it. We invented the present, we're gonna invent the future. That's a story. You have to think about branding Clinton as a story, not just as some slogan, but as a story. And it should be a story that says, we got great bones, we made some mistakes, we're going to fix them, and we want you to help us do that. Now, you have to tell that story with your own particulars, but that's the gist of it. That's the framework that I think will energize your own residents and attract the buyers of places. Now, who's the buyers of places? They tend to be empty nesters at the two ends of the age spectrum, so it's... It's the millennials, and it's the active boomers. <laughs> I, I heard this great phrase, by the way. I was down in Seaside for the first time, which is the new urbanist mecca, on what they, what they affectionately call the redneck Riviera in the panhandle of Florida. And it's just a wonderful place that really kind of evolved over time. It's kind of 
funky, um, unlike some of the newer new urbanist developments. It's been going for 30 years, so it's got a bit of patina. Anyway, they were having a s seminar down there on what they call aging in place with grace. Those of us who, well, here's the phrase I heard during that seminar that was so empowering. There's the young old and the old old. <laughs> and, you know, you know, partly attitude, partly health. But I said, you know, well, tell me, I've never heard that phrase before. What are you talking about? What, what, what's the break point? They said, well, the young old is up to 80. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with that. <laughs> so, um, the young old, as they become the old old, want to be in places where they can age in place with grace, where they don't have to go into senior ghettos, where they don't have to go to assisted living facilities. They can walk to what they need, and there is in this environment that they're in the kind of supports they need as they age. That's one group. And then there's the millennials who uh, are looking for a place where they can make their mark. But the interesting thing the American Planning Association just commissioned a study, I just got it yesterday or the day before, and they asked uh, millennials and boomers what they wanted in places, and almost in every category they wanted the same things. Mm -hmm. Almost in every category. And one of the big things they want is walkability. And that's all over your VCI study on Cheeseboro Ponds. You, you, you want walkability. And so does the market, the folks be, besides yourselves, who, who would be buying Clinton, if you think of it that way, want walkability. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in there. I won't go into all the details, but I mean, they both want places that are relatively safe. And I did some focus groups with another group of folks 10 years ago with, who were then Gen Xers in the kind of empty nester, young empty nesters 10 years ago were Gen Xers rather than Millennials. And I was surprised when we did the focus groups, we did 20 focus groups nationally with them, that they cared as much about safety. I, I didn't think they would. And that they cared as much about schools. They didn't think about kids yet. But they were thinking ahead and they wanted places that had good schools somewhere nearby. They wanted places that were relatively clean and safe. And so I, you know, I got the sense right then that they sort of wanted the same things that they would want when they grew up or got a little older. And that's confirmed by this recent APA study. They also wanted to be in a place where they could live their values. That was green with Gen Xers. I think it's even greener with um, millennials. And they have this sort of green and lean sort of thing with the sharing economy. They're not so much into having to exclusively own everything. They're quite willing to share other people's cars. They even heard clothes, you know, uh, rooms in their house. They're big in the Airbnb bit. And so having those kinds of internet-enabled sharing opportunities are part of, I think, what placemaking means in the first part of the 21st century. Um, you have... Uh, a phrase that you use in your VCI Cheeseboro Ponds thing with Cecil Group, the village. This idea of the village is probably the most powerful icon in the New Englander's mind. I was once um, working on a project that was um, working in that, in that area that straddles the Rhode Island Connecticut border, which we dubbed the borderlands, kind of had a romantic <laughs> notion to it. Um, by the way, the Ukraine translated means the borderland, but, uh, and it was the Wild West of its day when it was uh, uh, dubbed that. But um, there's, a, there's a relatively unfragmented forest that when you zoom out, you realize there's a necklace of 10 villages on the outer edge of that forest, 10 on each side of the border. And we got a group, it, we was, I was running the Economic Policy Council in Rhode Island at the time, and the um, Nature Conservancy, uh, there was a guy who had gone back and forth between Rhode Island and Connecticut, 
what they had made preserving this forest a priority of theirs. And they kind of convened all the enviros, and I convened the econs. And we got the enviros and the econs at the same time in the same place, somewhere in the borderlands. And at a certain point in one of these workshops, we said, all the enviros over there, all the econs over there, and you come back <coughs> with the one idea that would maximize your values. Mm -hmm. And they both came back with the same idea, which was concentrate development in the village. Because by doing that, you save the forest, and by doing that, you create this place of connection at an intimate scale that is what all people, including especially entrepreneurs and innovators, crave. We crave a place where we can connect with other people, that we can network with them, that we can develop ideas with them. And so by creating and reinforcing the villages, we protect the forest, but we also create a place of economic and intellectual intensity. Um, you're trying to do that, right? That is exactly the right thing to do. That is probably the single most powerful idea of placemaking is to create villages. You may have one, depending on the size of your community, or you may have multiple ones. They tend to each have a ped shed, is the term pedestrian shed, of a quarter to a half a mile, depending on how much you want to stretch the definition of how, how far folks will walk, but you can sort of um, think of a place as a set of circles with a quarter mile or half mile radius and that's that's the sort of the walking shed for retail in a node and you can string a number of those together and make a great place of, of walkable villages. Um, that's what the new urbanists have been up to for the last 30 years and they've, they've um, They've, they've got some good ideas. They were focused a bit more on green fields. They're now shifting their focus to infill in in development. You know, filling the spaces that were um, created by obsolete infrastructure, surface parking lots, uh, large manufacturing complexes, or old mills and so forth that aren't any longer valuable in their old form and their opportunities for redevelopment, um, both using some of the existing buildings and in some cases replacing them. Not every building is worth preserving and not every building that's worth preserving needs to be renovated to the rent equivalent of a new building. One of the best things about having a stock of old buildings, it's a reservoir of cheap space. And cheap space is what gives you diversity, diversity of people, diversity of shops, diversity of businesses. When Jane Jacobs, the famous goddess of urbanism, said new ideas come from old buildings, she wasn't talking about some mystical quality of heritage architecture, she was talking about cheap space. And I keep telling my historic preservation folks in my staff and our allies out there, don't renovate everything. Leave as much of it as you can in as-is condition. Make it weathertight and habitable, but don't increase the cost basis to the point where it crowds out diversity. Because that's the advantage we have with all this existing stock of old buildings that places younger than us that are just filled with new stuff don't have. Uh, so, those are some opening thoughts. Maybe we could do the rest of this by Q&A, depending on how much time you have. You have time. Okay. Time you have. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer questions or put some out, other food out there for thought, whatever you want to, wherever you want to go. Questions? Yeah. I'm just curious, you're a professional, you're a visitor to Clinton and you came over there 20 plus years ago. What appeals to you about Clinton and you coming to Clinton? What is it that captures you? Or... Well, when, I was, when we were doing that campaign... You said uh, people, but aside from... People. It was really the people. I, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the, the whole corridor from, 
from here up to, to um, Middletown on both sides of the river is an extraordinary place. You know, and, and there's a lot of it are wonderful places um, physically. I, the, the Nature Conservancy calls the Lower Connecticut River one of the 40 last great places in the Western Hemisphere. There's no other <coughs> one of those 40 in New England. We have the only one. So we, you know, one of the 40 last great places in the Western Hemisphere. And you should just, one of the things I would suggest in terms of your marketing of Clinton from a tourism standpoint is don't limit yourself to what's in Clinton. You know, you own Hammonasset as much as Madison does, right? It's a state beach. It's yours as much as it is theirs. But you also own the river. It's just right over there. And you own all the river towns, and you own all the coastline, and you own all this stuff. And you can package that up. I know the folks in the river cog are trying to do that. And that's a good idea. We, we're supportive of that. Uh, and, and certainly package everything that you have in Clinton from art to history to nature. But when I said I particularly like Clinton, what I was talking about from that campaign was one of the things you realize when you do a campaign is you have to build your own political organization because the town committees in each town are useless. State, 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 uh, hopefully not offending anyone or telling you anything you don't already know, but state central committee even more so. And you have to build your own organization. You kind of work from those people, you bring other people in. And the, the folks that we met at the time in Clinton were the folks that we liked the best, that we would hang with. And there was a diversity of people here that was less true in other places. Um, you know, this was 1988, so the Bluefish Festival was something young and new. Uh, I, I, I've heard that you guys are a little jaded about it, but it was pretty cool then. Um, and there were just, I don't know, we, we, we had uh, events at various venues around here that were, were, were interesting, but it was more um, kind of down-to-earth, uh, grounded, uh, real people. <coughs> I don't know how else to put it, it was just sort of, uh, you know how they say sometimes this guy's going to win versus that guy because this guy's the guy you like to have a beer with? So the folks in Clinton were the ones who yeah. like to have a beer with. Mm. So, just on the, on, the, on the whole differentiating and building the brand on this thing, um, how, in your experience, I mean, how discreet, specific does a certain town have to build its brand vis-a-vis -vis the neighboring towns. When you, I mean, when you really get into everything you're saying is right, and probably not the same thing Madison can say or Guilford. They're very different towns, right. but we, we do share a lot of the same bones, as you say, with a lot of towns around here. How, how, how well engineered or how engineered do you have to make the brand for Clinton so that if you're really going after somebody saying you should come to Clinton, not Westbrook? Trying to think of how you actually do this, and not just come down. Well, I think you should take all the marinas in Westbrook and own those too. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I mean, all this stuff is so stretchy, and it's out there, and it's as much, you know, it's right, you know, it's right on your border anyway. And you, you, you should own it as much as them. Um, so I would be, you know, I would make it an Irish sweater that can stretch over everything you can possibly stretch it over. Um, I. I think what you want to convey in the brand, and you would really stand out in Connecticut if you could convey this and you could deliver on it, that you're welcoming to newcomers, yeah. that your leadership circles are porous, that you want folks who weren't born here three generations ago to actually be part of the action that you actually will talk to them. You know, we have changed there, a lot. There, there are places in, I won't say, I, there's three or four that just pop into my head, that if, you, if your grandfather wasn't born here, then you're a newcomer. So that, just being open, being welcoming. That's something Alan has been saying. I mean, we're talking this whole thing about just the looking for, it kind of it did end up in the same place. Younger people, this, you know, these millennials, the, the walkability part, and the the where I am, kind of like empty nester at the other end of life, right. 
uh, they seem to be, you know, very, very attractive to, to everybody. But also the town's economics, just the town, I guess, we were the fifth most affordable town in Connecticut or something. Somebody it's said cheap. Cheap, it's cheap, which means cheap. <laughs> My wife means cheap, so the old means affordable. Um, but it is, you know, almost this, this outreach of having people come in that are living in Bridgeport, that are living in New Haven, that want to buy the first house. We got a lot of them here for sale. I mean, that's right. an attractive. Yeah, affordability, if you look at that APA study, was, was one of the top two or three. Number five yeah. or something. Yeah. State. So, but I mean, it, I'm saying in terms of what's the driver in place choice for both <laughs> millennials and, and, um, and active boomers, mm -hmm. affordability was one of the top two or three factors. So I, it, it, if, if you are relatively more affordable than other places in Connecticut, I'd go with that too. That, that's a very strong driver of location. And just a little, my last question, because I'll take a full advantage of your time. We had a line that we, uh, Sandy Luke actually wrote, sitting over there, for the 350, and it was 350 years anchored on the sound. Now, if you get rid of the 350, make it temporal, just make it this close, but this whole concept, and I understand the strategy should really start with a vision and all that, but ending up with a, usually sometimes a tagline shows you the gold, you mind back and so what's so wonderful about this line, but anchor down the sound yeah. does seem to be, it, it follows, it owns everything, we grabbed the sound, we grabbed, we basically commandeered everything. Yeah, you might as well there. just get both shore. We, <laughs> we grabbed everything we could, but this whole word of anchor is a very kinetic word. An anchoring, of family anchoring, of affordability, of community, of, I mean, I'm trying to sell this, I think, our role of committee here, but that's, that's a brand, is that a, a viable kind of a yeah, brand position? Yeah, I guess the, the thing you'd have to test is the whether, you know, sort of the ball and chain around your leg kind of thing, you know, whether it's, you know, kind of fixing you too much. But, Handcuffed to the shore? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shackled to the shore. Well, one of the the center of the shore. I, I, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is Clinton's almost exactly halfway between New York and Boston. Yeah. And that's, a really, yeah. that's, that's a really interesting thing. But for most people who travel through Connecticut on 95, they don't even know we have a shore. Right. I can't see it. You know, we have we have 30 from Stonington to Greenwich. We have 30 headlands and 30 harbors. It's a crenellated coastline. They they don't know that. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating, interesting coastline, and each one of those harbors has its own village that's unique. You've got yours. It's, um, it's just, uh, the, our marketing agency said, here's what people's view of Connecticut was, and they showed 95 and the Long Island Shore and the casinos. I said, well, <laughs> and you know, everything north was, was unknown. But I said, the only problem, could you erase the shoreline in that image because they don't know that. All they know is 95 in the casino. They don't know that you're on the coast and that it's a sweet coast. It's an incredibly sweet coast. They all know Clinton Crossing. <laughs> yes. Clinton Crossing, you could ask it cab driver in London. <laughs> and if they know the name Connecticut, the other two names they know are Clinton Crossing and Mohegan Sun. Or yes. That's true. Those, are, That's true. those are our those are our brands that are out there. So you know, claim the coast. Um, but I you know I, I think there's a lot of merit in you joining forces with some of your sister towns and co-marketing, you know, the lower, the lower river, the shoreline, um, whatever. It's all part of Avalonia. <laughs> you want to go way back. Um, there's this little piece of rock that goes from Rhode Island to roughly Branford. That was all part of one rock. <laughs> That's some of the oldest stuff. It's where the the pink granite of uh, Stony Creek comes mm -hmm. from, but it underlies all the shoreline a little bit up the that borderlands area, whatever. Uh, a bit of geologic uh, nonsense. <laughs> who uh, who came up with still revolutionary? And how did that come about? Well, that was uh, it, it was uh, the folks at Chowder who were our first creative agency. And now we have Adams and Knight, but we've kept with Still Revolutionary. 
we did a brand workshop that involved, uh, I think, 1,500 people overall. There was a smaller group that we worked more intensely, and that brand workshop was uh, driven by Jim Taylor at Harrison Group, which is based in Waterbury. And they came up with uh, the basic ideas that um, Connecticut is a place that inspires you to have an impact and where you not only feel you can make your mark, but you do make your mark. That the, the predominant feeling of a Connecticut resident is a sense of efficacy. We do things here, we get things done, we make our mark. And we were trying to capture that, we threw out some stuff that, and we went through some stuff that was too literal and too hall hallmark cardish which was, you know, things like simply inspiring and stuff like that, which would have been awful. But the, the, the other thing is that we wanted a brand that would work both for economic development and tourism. And whatever brand you come up with for Clinton has to work for both economic development and tourism and whatever else you're trying to do, because you can't have more than one brand. You're lucky to have one that breaks through. Most states don't get that, and they have separate brands, and neither of them mean anything. It was actually kind of a funny column by Gail Collins. Yeah, well, I just was going to point that out. Yeah, today. And, uh, today. Um, and she rips on all this. Yeah, Colin McEnroe was a little snarky about the song we did for the first thing, but that was probably the best thing about those spots was that song. He said the one thing that was remarkable about it is it didn't have the word Connecticut in it. But, um, <laughs> but it was a great song. I actually put it on my iPhone and played it on my radio every every day on the way to work because I liked it so much. But and people knew that song and it was emotional and it got you into this space, this feeling state about Connecticut that we're trying to get to. But the brand uh, needed to capture this history we've had of innovation, of trend breaking, and sort of we knew that nobody, none of the other thirteen, none of the other 12 original, of the original 13 colonies had claimed history as a, um, as a platform. Uh, any of them could have, although one could argue, as Washington said, that without Connecticut, the, the, the revolution would not have been won. We provided a third of the men and most of the food. The Connecticut Valley was one of the most productive agricultural places in the colonies at the time, and we, we had it under our control. The Brits didn't occupy it. So we fed the army and we provided about a third of the men and horses and all the rest of it. So we were essential. And that's a little recognized, but we started the most explosive phase of the Industrial Revolution. We really accelerated the cause of abolition with the Amistad incident, our finest moment in my view. Harry Beecher Stowe started the Civil War, according to Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> You know, Griswold started the women's liberation movement and the sexual revolution, you know, in terms of rights to privacy. And, uh, you could go through, you know, we have the oldest art museum in the country, also the first to stage an exhibit of modern art sent shock waves through the arts establishment at the time. We have this kind of combination of old and new, of tradition and groundbreaking. And the problem with a a position based on history is it could seem like you're stuck in the past. But if your history is the history of innovation, then you can get away with it. And that's what we were trying to say, that we were, we were a place that, you know, as I said before, <laughs> created the present, we're going to create the future. Most businesses want to be in a place where you're creating the future. So that works for economic development, but how does that work for tourism? And we struggled with that a little bit, but I think we really got it this time with this idea of revolutionary thoughts. What a revolutionary thought to go to Connecticut and not just do this, but to also do that. The, the, the kind of the yin and, and, the, yeah. and the yang, the zen and the zip. And we've been playing with all these dichotomies of, of really different things that you can do at the same time in the same place. You know, if you're one of those people that have actually more than one interest, <laughs> fancy that. And what we found is that 50 percent of people plan their trip while they're on their trip. They're calling audibles. They're doing stuff in real time. They're changing their plans. They're adding stuff. 
And so if you're a place that has a whole bunch of different stuff right next to each other, it really enables that kind of spontaneity. So that's the sort of revolutionary meaning that we're giving the brand in the tourism sector. So now I think it has life in both and the two will reinforce each other. I really, you know, I, I was uh, one of the final decision makers on which brand we would go with and we were, they were coming up with these different phrases and stuff and then I thought, oh my God, please no. And the guy came up with this one and I said, yes, that, that one sounds good. Then we, you know, focus group tested it and all. And I, you know, we were getting good feedback on it, but I wanted something more. So I called the focus group leader back and said, ask them which, which of the three they wear on a t-shirt. <laughs> and it's still a revolutionary one, hands down. I, I have several. <laughs> wear them whenever I get the least excuse to do so. Um, you know, I, I think it, uh, we, we mean for it not just to be about economic development, not just to be about tourism, but to express the fundamental pride of Connecticut in itself. And one of the things about Connecticut is we're Clintonians, but we're not nutmeggers or Connecticutians. <laughs> we're, we're very much of one place and not a collective of all those places. And so what we're trying to do is create in some ways, not just express, but to create a consciousness of the whole. Uh, you know, uh, we used to be citizens of our states. When the Union soldiers marched into the Battle of Antietam, they marched into it as citizens of their states. That day, the most horrific carnage in our history made them Americans. They walked away as citizens of a nation. And the citizenry of their stateness, especially for the Union soldiers, diminished. The place came up. The local place came up. So we became Clintonians and Americans and not so much Connecticut residents. So all these years later, now, we're trying to create Connecticut residents, Connecticut pride, a Connecticut identity. And I think it captures it. It captures the best of what we've been and what we aspire to be. And it's not just whatever the one they had, Nebraska nice. Did <laughs> <laughs> you live with that? <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, it's we you know. Yeah. Oh, you know. We Sometimes we're nice, but we're always revolutionary. Anyway. So, so all this is really good, but I have no patience. And I think, I think that, and Alan's smiling at me, but um, I think, you know, you, you can have a, a lot of plans, but people have to see that you can do something. Yep. You know, uh, we, can, we can meet, we can talk about a million things, and oh, this is what we should do here, and this is what we should do there. Somewhere we have to start placemaking. Yep. What's our first mm -hmm. step? You know, in my opinion, <laughs> it's Post Office Square. Um, that is, can, could be the most endearing spot other than the, on the water in Clinton. I mean, right now it's a cut through to Shore TV and Coffee Break. And that's basically, we have a, a psychic, and I'm, I wish they hadn't left. In a crooked house, we have a resort and spa <laughs> massage parlor. We have a barber shop. Dry About cleaners. it. What do we have? Dry cleaners. A dry cleaner, yep. Yeah. <laughs> we had an enchanting little store down at the end, but I guess the rent maybe was, she didn't have enough mm -hmm. uh, foot traffic. What can we do? I mean, how do we start? You know, we have all these grand ideas with Unilever and the old Morgan, but you know, there's people here that want to see something. Where do you start? How do you start? You can start with a single empty storefront. Maybe this is an opportunity for Ron to say something. But when we when, when we did this program create here now, um, there's a certain way that we say that, and that is create here now. <laughs> it's 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 now, not the day after tomorrow. It's now, 
because you're never going to get anywhere until you take that first step. Right. And the first step can be the reactiv reactivation of a single storefront. It works better when it's done two or three or four at a time, so there's some kind of cross synergy among them. But whatever the thing is that you can get folks mobilized to do quickly and build on is what you should do, but do something and then do something else and then but do something after that. But how do you get those, that. the owner of the buildings to, um, you know, not give it to the massage parlor? Or we have Freeman Smith. Cindy, Cindy Stevens is putting a little art, art place down. <clears throat> And, you know, we're hoping maybe that'll, Stephen renovated a building on Route 1 that looks gorgeous, you know. So, you, you know, you, some, somebody starts somewhere and you want it to move on. But I think when, when a, a private person, you know, a person owns this huge building right on Post Office Square and, and would rather have it empty than lower his rent, I guess. I don't know what it is. I mean, what, what can we do? What, what can we... Right. I've invited him to come tonight, but he... My, my name's Ron here. I'm, I'm <laughs> representing Bill Chin. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> my name's Rod France. I represent... Uh, I'm the director of Create Here Now, which is about an eight-month eight month old initiative that was launched under uh, Kip's Watch. And uh, I work with Margaret Bodell, who is one of the top storefront repurposing people in the United States. Uh, she has a sterling reputation. You may have heard about the event up in uh, New London uh, last night where we partnered with uh, Main Street New London as well as the City of New London Economic Development Department. You, if you form that kind of uh, alliance, uh, landlords in our uh, experience tend to be more receptive. And we usually go into a place, and I don't know if there are any landlords here tonight, I probably shouldn't give away our strategy, but, and, and say we need, we need free space, we have people who will occupy these buildings or these spaces, these storefronts, who have the possibility of evolving into rent-paying businesses. And uh, we, need, we need four months uh, free, free rent just to allow them to do a little bit of build-out and, uh, and, and get their feet under them. Uh, and we're, we're seeing success with that approach uh, in, in downtown Bridgeport, which is a very hard nut to crack. Uh, in Torrington with what used to be called Morrison's Hardware. It was an abandoned hardware store. Margaret saw this building and said, this is it. Because it wasn't on Main Street, it was on River Road at the height of the land in Torrington. And that now has uh, a, a experimental theater called DeSultry Theater Club, who we'll also bring in musical acts from all around the state as well as from Brooklyn and touring bands come there. And, and they've developed this reputation as being just a great place to play. Everyone who's ever played there says the same thing. I love DST, DeSultry Theater Club, or DT, DTC. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're doing this in, in, uh, on State Street in New London right now. And if you dialogue with the building owners, the property owners, you can build a vision for them where they begin to see the possibilities of what you're talking about. And they also get a lot of uh, credibility in the community, I think, for mm -hmm opening their doors instead of just having these shuttered stores fronts everywhere you turn uh, and buildings that are uh, underutilized. And, and what's happened uh, in Morrison's uh, Hardware, which is now called the Morrison's Artist Collective, um, is that the people who occupied that building uh, began paying rent and utilities, uh, I think, in December. This was after six months. I mean, it was fairly, fairly fast ramp up. They're not paying market value, but what's market value if your building's been empty for four years? You know, it's, it's market value is sort of a hard term to define. So uh, I, I think Alan, Alan won me over when I first met him when I arrived here tonight, and he said, this doesn't have to take a lot of money. That's a, a lot of places where we go are expecting us to come in with a trunk full of $100 bills and say, hey, how much of this do you need? And what we come in with is, is expertise and experience and, and ideas about the actual, actually the proper location to do something like this. And I like the sound of the place you're talking about. I mean, I admit I don't know it. This is my first visit to Clinton. Uh, I was living in Washington, D.C. three years ago before I came up here to work for Kip Bergstrom. But, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very gradually going to every corner of, of every community in this state, uh, which is a real blessing. I really like Connecticut a lot. But, um, I, I, think, I think starting somewhere and maybe sitting around the table, a group of six or eight people who are interested in this approach, 
Uh, we'll get Margaret here, I'll come, and we'll, we'll have coffee some morning or lunch some afternoon, however you would like to do that. Take a walk around and determine if, in fact, That's the place crazy. that you're talking about to our eyes looks feasible. And we're not infallible in that, but we do have a lot of experience. And uh, uh, you can't talk landlords into throwing out the tattoo parlor. That's really not what this is about. Uh, the tattoo parlor will e either thrive or they'll move on uh, of their own volition at some point. And artists are not afraid of uh, massage parlors. They're not afraid <laughs> of micro <laughs> bars. The, 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 build, you know, the building that Mr. Chittenden owns is a, is a, you talk about old bones. I mean, this is, you look at all the old pictures of the Senator Clinton and that building's there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you don't necessarily want to get rid of it. No. You know, um, no, but, we're you know, that's... We're also about knocking things down. I mean, we're very much about renewing. Yeah. And, and because we have Kip Bergstrom at the head of all of these departments that he mentioned, uh, was it six months ago we launched um, uh, uh, historic arts catalyzed place making historic preservation. It's a grant that our historic preservation office makes, and they have more money than the Pope to uh, to to take these buildings that have been. Uh, you know, left unattended uh, for a long time and, and, and begin to restore those buildings and, and make them habitable for people who are not only artists, but we're also looking for innovators. We've got a lot of uh, startup businesses who are part of this effort. Yes? Um, yeah. I was talking with Jane earlier about this idea, um, and I'm sure you know about places like the Grove in, in uh, New Haven, and I think there's an article in the Times about the innovation space that's in um, I can't remember, but this idea of shared space where co work spaces, how it's shared, so that when yeah. people want to start up a small business, they don't have to invest, you know, right. everything. Right. That they the Grove have. was uh, so before I stole her from New Haven, Margaret Bodell, who Rod mentioned, ran Project Storefronts in New Haven. One of her first storefronts was the Grove. Her, her first storefront in New Haven was the Grove, but it started out with a, a storefront, and then now it's taken over. Eight or ten blocks of that that area. Well, but not so they relevant. have shared. I mean, so you, you buy a membership, and you can either have a seat right. at the table, or a, like a library carol, or maybe you have a small office. But there's a, a conference room, so that mm -hmm. if you want to have clients in, you don't have to have their own conference room. I mean, nobody needs a conference room every day. There's small meeting rooms. There's shared internet. There's a copier that you use, like the one here. There's a fax machine. You know, so that you're buying a seat at the desk or whatever you want to see that, but there's also shared It would be interesting to see if that would work in a place like Clinton. They, they have tended to be, um, you know, there, there's a pretty famous one called General Assembly in Chelsea. There's some in uh, Brooklyn. There's a bunch in Cambridge around Kendall Square. In, in, in Connecticut, they're in Stamford, uh, New Haven, Danbury, Hartford. Um, Bridgeport. The middle Bridgeport has one. Yeah, Beehive. That's a pretty cool one. Um, there's probably a dozen or so of them, but most of them, if not all of them, right now are in the small cities. Uh, you know, none of our cities are big. Um, whether it would work in a town or not is interesting. Don't, don't you have to look at the base that you have? Yeah. Because there are skill sets that exist in this town, and people struggle to start businesses with those skill sets. So you start with the skill sets. Oh, yeah. A lot of service businesses here. Right, a lot of people <clears throat> with construction skills, maintenance skills, you bring that group together. It might not be your technological innovator, right, right. but it's an innovator. Yeah, the, 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 the same building. The folks, they start to yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, whether you know various kinds of trades and services could be not just sharing space, but even sharing uh, equipment and and workers and the like. I mean, there's ways that the sharing economy could really take off. The question is, you know, if you, if, if Clinton was successful in, in, in recruiting a lot more millennials, they have been, so far at least, the primary occupant of co-work spaces. And so if, if, you, if, if, there was a, if you could make a compelling reason for them to be in Clinton, then a, a subset of them would probably want to co-work. But where you're starting out without as many of them, whether you currently have a market to support co work space or not, I don't know. Yeah, well, that seems to be the, the place, that the way that if we look outside of Clinton, that's what we need to look outside of Clinton, and if there's nothing else between here and New London that provides that kind of opportunity, 
you know, there are people in Guilford or Madison right. or, you know, where Yeah, so who's going to be the sort of beating heart of the shoreline, right, between <coughs> New Haven and New London? Mm -hmm. It's kind of up for grabs. There isn't a beating heart right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Old Saybrook wants it. Mm -hmm. uh, you may want it. Go for it. You know. Well, it's a different heart. I mean, that's the. Yeah, you can have two hearts, I suppose. <laughs> but, you know, but, but you know, Old Saybrook wants to be the shopping center still. No, I mean, I was actually talking to the economic development director there, and she's thinking along the lines that you just mentioned with co work space and the text and the millennials and all that. So, I mean, it certainly doesn't. I live in Old Saybrook, so I, it certainly isn't what it is, but it may be at least what she wants it to be. The question is, I don't, I don't know of a group like this that's mobilized in Old Saber. And if you've got a group of folks that are getting together, partly because of our VCI grant, Brad, see you, uh, that, that's generated this kind of uh, shared interest in doing something, then you're ahead of the game. That, this itself is your, is your basic social capital, this group. Because I don't think there is another group like this between New Haven and New London that I've seen. But what's our next step? What, just before, one of the things we, before we before Ron does leave, I think action item number one is definitely Margaret and Ron and a group of people to do a walk around. That's a good idea. Uh, I mean, Absolutely. let's let's do it. I, I want to get you know, to follow up with a conversation with you about the branding thing anyway. So I'll give yeah. you my card. If anyone else wants a card, uh, I mean, that would be a wonderful way of actually walking around and get some specifics. I'm very much the site. point of contact for Create Here Now. Margaret is a real head down, get the job done kind of person. And so I'm the, I'm the person who generally comes to things like this or, or yeah. does things like this. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll definitely pursue yeah. this. Excuse me, how do you spell Margaret's last name? B-O-D-E-L-L. -L. Okay, thank you. And this and, is and Rod, this not Ron, R-O-D, France. F R A N T Z. You know, we have a building in town. It could be a shining star. That's the academy building, mm -hmm. and we all own it. And if you say there's money out there for historical buildings, um, obviously that is one. What and it seems soon to be empty. And it could be make a perfect artist collective. Uh, you know, right on Main Street. What a what an opportunity. It was our, it was our town hall, the Baptist Brad church. Brad is expert in all of our, I'm going to have to take off, but Brad has deep knowledge of all of our historic uh, preservation tools and can share those with you. Brad, I don't know if you can stay a little or... I can stay for a while longer. I've got a four-month-old puppy in the back of my house. Oh. 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 i got to go at some time. Thanks a lot. It was really good. Thank you.